I'm just gonna go ahead and like do like a small little introduction so good afternoon everyone on the East Coast and good morning everyone who's in California um, I am very excited to host our fifth international student speaker series with my fellow SISAC member Ricky Roy uh, if you haven't already make sure to tune into our previous conversations on YouTube channel um, on our SISAC GT channel I am so to introduce myself. My name is Kira Vidanina, and I'm a member of the School of Aerospace Engineering Student Advisory Council, SISAC, which I joined as my second semester, Georgia Tech. Uh, I'm a national student from Kazakhstan, and I came to the United States with a dream and, well, now a goal to make the world a better place by promoting equality and diversity and contributing to the development of highly efficient propulsion systems for spacecrafts. Uh, to all the international students uh, tuning into this conversation, I would like to open by saying that I do understand what you're going through and all of the challenges that you like meet on a daily basis. Uh, it's not easy to be a foreign national in the aerospace industry in any country. Uh, the main goal of uh, this series is to bring professionals from all over the world from different backgrounds so they can share their experience um, and like little tips and tricks with us. And I hope um, we can be a bridge between international students and professionals and give some inside hope and motivation. Uh, I am so honored to introduce Dr. Maureen Howarty, who is a COO of Polo Fusion. Uh, it's a Silicon Valley space propulsion startup. Um, Dr. Maureen received her PhD in nuclear engineering at the University of Manchester, uh, and she also worked in nucle nuclear fuel performance and fuel management at the UK's, UK's National Nuclear Lab, uh, prior to joining Apollo Fusion. Um, and uh, she also manages a number of programs, including commercial constellations and government programs, uh, and leads interactions with the ranges, launch providers, and regular agencies. Um, I am very, very excited that you are able to give us some time from your very busy schedule, and I am very excited for this event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kira, and thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much also for taking time out of a Saturday to um, listen into a professional event. Um, I'm really impressed, and I'm really flattered that um, you've asked me to speak to you. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to talk you through a little bit about um, my background, what I currently do. Um, as uh, hopefully you can hear, um, I'm not a uh, I'm not a U.S. citizen. Um, I am I'm Irish. Um, I, I'm Irish. I took my did my undergraduate in Ireland, um, and then I moved to the UK to work in the nuclear industry, um, and then uh, I moved out here to work in space. So I'll talk a bit about that, but just uh, I just wanted to say I do understand some going through and I've worked in two different industries where it is difficult to be um, an international student or an international worker so um, I do understand um, and hopefully I can offer some advice. Um, here is already um, uh, giving you uh, my background just if, if any of you um, uh, don't know chief operating officer is kind of a jack of all trades um, so I do a lot of different activities especially trying to bring up new new activities in the company. So I do a mixture of business development, so actually working with customers from the very start and trying to do sales and program management when those programs come in. Um, and then also um, our manufacturing uh, our, our manufacturing side as well. Obviously, as a startup, um, we do R&D, but we also want to be able to manufacture for constellations. Um, and uh, I can talk a bit about that in a second. So um, a little bit about us, Apollo Fusion. Um, 
Uh, as Kira said, we're an electropropulsion startup. We're based in Silicon Valley, so in Mountain View, California. We work on hull thrusters. Um, we've got about 20 full-time staff, and that probably is about 40 with uh, various consultants, 80% engineers and about 25% PhDs. So we are really R&D focused and it's really enjoyable. I was talking to a former colleague about the company and, you know, his point was like, wow, it must be really nice just working in a company where it's about 80% engineers. You know, there's a lot of science going on. There's a lot of engineering and it is exciting. We've had several recent wins, um, so which has been a mixture of U.S. government and commercial. Um, we're so the U.S. government are both one-off satellites and uh, constellations, and we've also got some commercial uh, small geo and some other commercial programs coming down the line as well. So one of the things that's unique about us um, as a as a propulsion company is that we actually design the entire system. Um, we design the hull thruster and the power propulsion unit. Um, and then we work with partners for the tank and the feed system. They do unique feed systems and tanks for our programs. Um, and then for, I believe, um, I, at least half of our customers so far, and probably about 80% of our customers in the long term, we'll be delivering an integrated propulsion module. So either a spacecraft panel or some kind of fixture with the thrusters, a PPU, and the tank and feed system all uh assembled together and operating together on the panel that brings a lot of challenges from acceptance integration and test and that's one of the things i i manage um, we work with a strategic manufacturing partner um, in the us so that we can deliver for constellation programs some people take the option to be vertically integrated or that they do everything in-house that's not our approach that's not really the silicon valley approach we work with a strategic manufacturing partner um, they're under our direct supervision and they're based in the US. Um, I think one of the first things that um, is important to talk about for international students is we're not ITAR. So uh, plenty of space companies in the US and internationally have non-US work persons working for them. I think we're probably about 25% of the company are non-US persons. Um, that, and at the moment, people are able to work across the the full breadth of our programs. That's because the, the propulsion technology is not ITAR. If we have classified programs, that would be US person only. Um, but at the moment, we're fine. So I think that's the first thing to know is that there's lots of companies where there are uh, foreign nationals working there. Um, and it really depends on the expert control and the level of classification of the programs. So I'll talk a bit more about what what might be helpful when you're applying for jobs if you're an international student. But just so you know, first thing, we're not ITAR. Um, because you're all aerospace engineers, I thought I'd show you a little bit of the thrusters. So this is the Apollo Constellation engine, um, the smaller uh, thruster. It's 400 watt. It's 400 watt system. I would say it's good for a 200 kilogram satellite. So we're not looking at CubeSats. I don't think we would look at anything. Realistically, most um, satellites won't have the power of it required for electropropulsion or, or hull thrusters, certainly, until they're about 150 kilograms. And then Apollo Ace Max is about a 1.5 kilowatt system. Um, so uh, the Ace Max system, they both operate on xenon and krypton. The Ace Max system is uh, magnetically shielded for an extremely long night life, um, 1.5 mega newton seconds. Um, and um, is used for larger satellites or very high delta v missions so this i think is a really interesting uh experiment that we did for a u.s government customer uh just before the holidays um and i've shared it with every propulsion engineer um because it really hasn't been done before so uh the customer wants to fire two more four thrusters together but wants to have them canted towards each other for, for momentum management reasons the, the issue is that potentially the plume plasma can interact with each other and it could actually affect the uh, lifetime performance of the thruster. So um, also there's obviously thermal issues as these thrusters are getting quite hot as well. So we canted them towards each other. And so actually the plumes are interacting, as you can see, but it doesn't so far seem there's any negative interaction. We do need to do further testing. That was a really exciting test and a 
I asked some customers who are based locally to come around. It's like, if you come around, you'll get to see this test and also you'll get to turn the thrusters on. So we kind of did a little bit of a sales gimmick, but also it was kind of just fun as engineers. So, um, so that's one of the nice things about working in an R&D lab. We have our, uh, facility, our own facility, so we can do lots of different exciting experiments quite quickly. Okay, so um, I want to talk about a little bit about my path because um, hopefully it can kind of give you some insight into into opportunities that you might be able to take or or how how being an international student sometimes is negative, sometimes is positive. So um, I don't know if any of you know, but Ireland um, and I am Irish and I went and did my undergrad in Ireland. Um, is uh, militantly anti-nuclear. There, are, you know, there's a total ban on on nuclear power plants and any kind of nuclear activity in Ireland. Ireland's really, really anti-nuclear. So it is a, it is extremely unusual to be an Irish nuclear engineer. I might be one of the only ones in the world. So um, how did I do that? So first of all, I did civil engineering in Ireland, and um, Honestly, I probably didn't think that through well enough. I knew I wanted to do engineering, and certainly at the time in Ireland, Ireland's a really small country, it's only 4 million people, there isn't really the diversity of engineering options. Um, you can do mechanical engineering, you certainly can't do aerospace engineering, and it's kind of like if you were academic, you're really good at maths, you would go and do civil engineering, um, or civil instructional engineering as I did, um, because there's kind of a clear uh, job path. And honestly, I did civil engineering, and I hated it. Uh, it wasn't precise enough for me. It was. Um, it wasn't precise enough for me. I, I just was not interested in it. I felt like you know, the maths wasn't deep enough, and, and you know that kind of thing. Um, I will point out actually, I did get careers advice from someone who said before before I did civil engineering in Ireland, they were like, "Oh no, you should apply. You should do aerospace engineering." Um, in the UK, and I was like, "No, I couldn't even see it. Living in Ireland, I couldn't even see a job path for that." So. Uh, I uh, got good advice and ignored it. The unfortunate problem in Ireland is, is that if you do a degree, if you want to switch degree, it's not really set up for that. So even if I wanted to switch to electrical engineering, I'd have to go back and restart electrical engineering. So I kind of decided I was just going to stick it out with civil engineering. Now, the I want to talk about the scholarship I had. It's a Science Foundation Ireland scholarship, and it's actually a scholarship that I got coming out of high school into college. And it's actually Science Foundation Ireland scholarship uh, for women in engineering. And I really hesitated about applying for it because I was like, oh, I don't need any scholarship. I don't want to be associated with any, uh, you know, awards as being a woman or anything like that. And, you know, I was kind of like 18, very like uh, tough about that. But honestly, it was a small amount of free money. And it came with a research internship that I would have to do in third year. And I just thought, look, I'll just apply for it. And I got it. And I am really, really glad that I did that. Um, so my first advice for everyone is if you can apply for uh, any kind of scholarship, you know, with associated with being a woman, an international student from your home country, diversity, minority, apply for it. Um, get the opportunities, take the opportunities, don't feel like that it's painting you in a certain way um, because it, you can get really good opportunities that you wouldn't otherwise. Why that was really important, the Science Foundation Ireland scholarship is, is that I had to do this research internship and, you know, they, they were luckily and they were going to pay me to do this research internship I had to do at the end of third year of college. And at this point, I was really disliking civil engineering. I was like, I just want to get it done probably just going to go into finance after um, really didn't, you know, whatever. I did have one subject that I really liked, which was structural um, and structural mechanics. So that was much more maths focused. And I went, I, um, the research internship, they, were, they gave me a list of like, oh, here are things that you could do, you know, you know, have a look at those. But honestly, I kind of, a lot of them were in Dublin and I didn't want to go to Dublin. I'd spent previous summers, you know, in Toronto and in Boston just fun part-time jobs and I didn't want to go to Dublin because I was like oh the research internship doesn't really pay enough to work in Dublin so I'll go and talk to my lecturer um uh, I'll go and talk to my lecturer for structural mechanics it's one course I'm really loving and see if I can do a uh, an internship with her and fortuitously she was like oh wow this is amazing I actually work I've worked with this company in the U.S called Anatech, and I have worked with them since my PhD, and I've always wanted to do research activity with them, but I just 
just because they're a small company, it's hard to get funding to do with them. I'm going to talk to them and we'll see if they can come, we can come up with a project for them. And she did that. And the intention I was going to stay in Cork in Ireland. She did that and they said, like, oh, we're always looking for research interns. Um, we'd love to have Maureen come out to San Diego and do uh, and, and do an internship with us. So and they were a nuclear engineering company and I went out there and so they did structural and nuclear. And honestly, about two days in, you know, they were like, oh, we've got some extra work in the nuclear side. Do you want to do that? And I was like, yes, threw myself into that. And for someone who had, you know, been doing fine in civil engineering, but not really great, I absolutely adored nuclear engineering. It was precise. It was really mathsy. It was, you know, just really exciting. There was a nuclear renaissance going on at the time. And I came back from that internship and was like, and, you know, they were they were uh, also a small company. Lots of people there had PhDs. They really suggest I go on and do a PhD in nuclear. They gave me brilliant references going back into fourth year, my final year of my undergrad. And we're like, she's really good, folks are on research, all this kind of stuff. Um, and they helped me and they suggested that I do a PhD in nuclear engineering. I wanted to do it in the UK. And they said that Manchester was a really good place to do it. Um, it's Manchester is really known for nuclear engineering in the UK. So with their references and the references I then got from that lecturer and um, that really uh, that that really helps me and I got a PhD in nuclear engineering in Manchester. But always, you know, I never wanted to work in academia, and that's something I'm going to talk about in a minute. It never occurred to me that I would work in academia. Um, and uh, so after my PhD, I became a research technologist, which is basically just a, 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 a permanent position researcher. No, it's flicking through. Um, permanent position researcher at the National Nuclear Lab in the UK. I worked in spent fuel performance and fuel performance. What that means is that you take in nuclear fuel and you uh, chop it up and perform various different experiments on it. I focused on microscopy. And, um, and and see how it's behaving, why it's failed in reactor or why it's failed in during storage. Then on the back of that, my partner got a job. Uh, partner got a job in the US, so we moved out to the US to uh, San Francisco. And through you know meeting people who worked at Apollo Fusion, they were the name is Apollo Fusion. They were doing nuclear at the time, and I started doing a little bit of work for them, helping out um, through a friend. Um, they hired me and then I've worked my way up there from being a director to a VP to a COO. Six months after I joined, uh, they switched from being a nuclear fusion company to a space company and um, and uh, I, I stayed on. And I think one thing that's also really important is that with my background doing a PhD and also having done civil engineering, so different engineering topics, it became it was quite easy for me to switch to space. So I'm I'm very, very, very comfortable switching around in different areas of engineering and all my progression since uh, in Apollo from v, to VP and to CO have been since we were a space company. And actually, it I feel that I've uh, succeeded a lot more professionally since we switched to being a space company. So I'm definitely an advocate for like do a lot of different things and try a lot of different things. OK, so um, PhDs, uh, I want to talk a bit about like why you would do one, because I feel we have a lot of interns who come in or, you know, graduate engineers who come into the company or, or who came into NNL. Um, and they had lots of thoughts about why they would do a PhD and why they wouldn't. So first of all, doing a PhD is really, really hard. Um, and it's definitely something you definitely need to be academic. Um, you can't be a weak student going and doing PhD, but you don't necessarily need to be. I think there's two different kinds of academic. There's academic who loves to learn and doesn't necessarily need a lot of structure. And there's academic and they just like love exams and there's a strict curriculum and you learn that and you follow that. And that's really and they're both really good and there's nothing wrong with either either. But you definitely can't be the person who needs structure, I think, to do the PhD. I think you need to be love learning for its own sake. So in my opinion, a good reason to do a PhD, because it's going to be hard throughout, is to do it because you absolutely love learning. You're the kind of person who for your entire life, you're going to you're going to read papers, you're going to read books, you're going to want to learn about new ideas, you're going to want to learn a new language because it's interesting to you, you're going to do a night class, all this kind of thing. I think you can never do a PhD if you're someone who's like, oh, I just need to get through this one more exam. 
and that's it. I'm done. I'm done with my learning. And there's lots of people who are like that. Um, and I wouldn't do a PhD uh, if you want to do that. It is useful for both. Ac obviously, it's essential for academia. I think for a lot of industries, a PhD is really useful, certainly in nuclear, where there's a huge amount of R&D um, going on. Um, the reason there's so much R&D going on in, in nuclear is not so much in developing new power plants. It's actually in dealing with old power plants. Um, so the vast majority of research in the or old power plants or in old mistakes we made um, in terms of you know managing fuel previously. So it's kind of straightforward to to design a power plant or a new power plant, and there's less research required for that area. Although I, I like China is doing a huge amount of research in that area, for example, for Gen four reactors, but. Any area where they're kind of having to deal with all mistakes, um, you research is a big deal. And, and so nuclear, because research is still a huge uh, part of being a nuclear engineer, a PhD is very useful there. I don't think it seems to be as essential to uh, for aerospace engineering, for example. So don't feel that you need to do a PhD for aerospace engineering. You know, we're about 25 percent PhDs in a kind of an R&D focused company. Whereas probably in nuclear, that would be at least 50 percent. So um, good things about doing a PhD is it helps you prepare you to learn a lot of different things rapidly. So definitely help me move into space. So and if someone gives me a kind of a topic, a two sentence description of what needs to be done and I'll go and learn it and I'll, I'll find out the necessary things. And I think a lot of PhDs would be like that. So some bad reasons I've come across for doing a PhD. Uh, I think probably the worst possible reason for doing a PhD is because someone has offered you a PhD. So I think I see a huge number of um, of interns who come to us or uh, or graduates or, or especially in, in NNL who are like, oh, I was offered a PhD. And, and honestly, the fact is 50 percent of people either fail or leave their PhD. Being offered a PhD is not a sign that you can actually finish it through to the end. It's really hard, if not impossible, for a lecturer or a professor to work out whether you'll actually be able to do a PhD. You need to do a PhD for your own reasons. And for that reason, I would that's one of the reasons I would really suggest going to a different university um, to do a PhD than your actual undergrad. The reason being is that if you it's kind of too easy if you do it at your at the place you did your undergrad, they just offer it to you. And, you know, whereas at least if you've made the effort to apply to other universities, you've really thought about whether you want to do it. So um, don't just do it because someone's offered it to you. You really need to think about why you're doing it. And definitely one thing I would say is is that the middle bit of your PhD. So in the UK, it's about a four year PhD. I think in Germany, it's about a seven year PhD. So let's say that for the middle year or the middle year and a half, is miserable. It's and this is just universal across across everywhere. Um, I because I was saying that to a German student, oh yeah, it's four years in the UK, and they're like, that's great because it's seven years in Germany, and because the middle bit is horrible, that you've got a shorter horrible middle bit. Okay, so I would say it, it it's it's really hard. So you really have to like love learning. You have to love what you're going to get out of it. Um, so that's that's important. And then the other thing is that definitely I found my PhD really hard because I went straight from civil engineering to nuclear engineering. I thought it'd be fine. I had done an internship in nuclear engineering. It definitely wasn't enough. And I found my PhD a lot harder, particularly at the start than I, than I would have otherwise. So I would definitely kind of think about that. If you want to switch areas hugely, think about working maybe for a year or maybe you're doing a master's. Um, I, it definitely was harder than it needed to be, and it was it was a lot more miserable. I think I enjoyed my PhD less than some people because of that. Having said all that, I don't think your PhD topic matters whatsoever. I did a PhD in nuclear graphite, so here, um, here is oh, let me do it. My sharing has stopped. Let me start again. Um, Hmm. Uh, Kira, can you see me uh, sharing? It says I'm sharing, but it also says that no one is sharing their video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see your, the presentation. 
Okay, perfect. Okay, so here is a uh, nuclear graphic graphite. So I did my PhD on uh, nuclear graphite, which is the moderator in in basically all of the UK's national uh, labs. Um, you'll probably know about it from Chernobyl, and in fact, my PhD supervisor was one of the scientists who went to um, who went to Russia after um, after the Chernobyl accident to help them change their uh, their operation of the RBM case um, to improve safety. So um, basically, uh, the moderate graphite uh, swells and changes over its operation, um, and that makes it, and it cracks for a number of different uh, material property reasons, mechanistic reasons, which are affected by the high temperature that it's under, also combined with pressure, and obviously the fact that it's being irradiated. Um, and obviously, you need to be, it's a structural element, you need to be able to get the, few, the control rods down through it. So obviously, you'll know all this from if you watch the Chernobyl TV series. Um, and also, it holds the, uh, the fuel rods in place. They're different in the UK. They don't have, uh, they don't have water, they're not water cooled, they're gas cooled. Why this all matters is that the uh, reactors in the UK are aging, they're suffering from cracking in the graphite moderator, and they want to be able to extend the lifetime. But, uh, the you can't extend the lifetime just using empirical models. You have to have a mechanistic understanding. So my PhD was looking at the mechanistic understanding of um, of the effect of irradiation on the thermal expansion and the crystal orientation, how that was related to the crystal orientation of the graphite. It was a fine and interesting topic to do for your PhD. I'm not going to work in graphite after my PhD. I never really had any intention of doing so. Um, the PhD, all your PhD is learning how to do research. Um, and so it doesn't really matter the topic that you're doing it in. And I would say that very, very, very few people, I know maybe 10% of people I know that did a PhD have actually stayed on doing the actual topic, even, even closely related, let alone the exact same topic as they did for their PhD. I think the field matters, like, you know, do you nuclear engineering versus aerospace obviously matters. Um, but it's really the skills you pick up. So I picked up a lot of experimental skills um, and also a lot of experimental skills, but actually then using modeling um, with that. Um, it's the skills. The topic is interesting enough for you to continue on. The topic isn't too hard so that you quit. I definitely know some people who have picked out, out way too difficult topics. Um, and then you're probably just going to change into a different area. So I think the topic really doesn't matter. I know people who've done neuropsychology and have moved into neuroscience, which is actually quite a large leap. Um, obviously, people who've done uh, PhDs in data science obviously move, move from, let's say, DNA to different areas. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about the topic too much. You just choose a, choose a university, choose a good supervisor, and I think, um, and do it in the right field, and I think um, then you can work out from there. Okay, so that's a that's a lot on PhDs, and I realize I I'm taking a lot of time in this. So I want to talk about how to approach jobs and how and how to stand out during the hiring process. I think the first thing to think about is what kind of company do you want to work for? Three basic kind of companies um, are startups, um, small a uh, small company, and a large company. Um, and so startups, obviously, a company like us. If you're straight out of college. Um, Startups are going to give you an incredible amount of responsibility for someone straight out of college. Uh, we probably, if you're an intern, uh, will give you a lot of responsibility, uh, even if you're an intern. And you know, you can do really cool things working in a space startup as an intern or as a graduate engineer. Some of your stuff is probably going to actually end up in space. Um, having said that, and it's going to be really exciting, and you know, it'll be there'll be lots of ups and downs. It does give you a lot more understanding, I think, of how business works as well, because, you know, startups really need to worry about cash flow and like bringing in customers and like, oh, sorry, we can't buy that because, you know, uh, financially at the moment we can't do that. And and it's not just a, a yes, no. It's like it's really like you understand how how the business is working. On the other hand, I think if you come into a startup, particularly if you're straight after an undergraduate or a master's, to a slightly lesser extent straight after a PhD, but I, I think it's, it still holds a little, is that you kind of miss out on a lot of the basics. Um, and what I mean by the basics is, um, I think that in 
as an engineer in doing your undergrad, doing your PhD, things like, you know, having your drawings properly dimension tolerance is, is less of an issue. Making sure you do real design reviews, um, you know, this kind of thing. And then you come into a startup and they don't have that structure and that rigor around that. It can be, and also you don't have someone mentoring you as much. You just don't get that kind of ba the basics that, you know, maybe in five years you'll regret having. On the other hand, you'll get lots of responsibility and experience. But, you know, you might be a bit of a nightmare to work with in five years time if you go into kind of a company where that stuff really matters. Small company, you do get a lot of attention, but um, maybe not the variety of. So a small company is kind of like a standard company that's definitely going to exist. You know, maybe like it has 100 people working there or a thousand people working there. Um, you get a lot more attention, but you might not have the variety of projects. Um, and then a large company, I think you get great brand recognition like you know, there's no doubt about it that on a resume, if you can say that you've worked at Tesla or if you've worked at SpaceX or whatever, people are more likely to pick up the resume and people are more likely to interview you. So I think that's really good. You also have a structure like, you know, they'll have a path for graduate engineers to on. So I think you'll get your basics really down, but you're really unlikely to have proper responsibility because there's going to be someone who's more qualified and experienced to do it. Because to to do to do that whereas in a startup there's no one there's no one else to do it there's no duplication of skills um so i think you need to think about what suits you i i personally think that a startup is better after you've worked somewhere else maybe at a large company for a couple of years and then um go and work for a startup i think you get more out of it i think i definitely got a lot more out of working at startup having worked kind of at a real national lab where rigor was was important for a couple of years I think that's useful. OK, post PhD going into industry. First thing I want to say is PhDs are really useful in industry. Um, I th there's a, there's obviously two paths after a PhD. You can go into academia or you can go into industry. And both people who've taken either option are going to not understand why someone else would choose the other option. Um, so uh, I think it's really useful in industry. Um, but I do think that if you want to go into an industry, uh, so I, I would say it's really useful in industry. It, it teaches you your, your research method. Um, it makes you very flexible. It gives you rigor, all that kind of stuff. And it indicates that you're smart. You've really like learned an area in depth. Um, so all of that's useful. But if you do want to go into industry after a PhD, I would say go straight into industry. Some people think that if you go and do a postdoc, I, sorry, I think people who go and do a postdoc think that that makes them more employable in industry than if they just gone straight from a PhD. And unfortunately, that's not true. Um, uh, I, I, I saw that a lot, even at, at the National Lab, that people were, you didn't really get any benefit from having done a postdoc compared to having gone straight from a PhD. Um, basically, the things that employers worry about um, when you have a PhD, your first job after is they're worried that you're going to be unwilling to pitch in. So they're really worried that you're going to be like, I have a PhD, I'm really smart, I'm not going to like do kind of the, the grunt work. Um, so you really need to be able to convey that, like come in with examples in an interview of times that you've pitched in, all work is meaningful, um, you know, times when, you know, you've, you've done miserable jobs in the lab, but it, they just have to be done. I think that's important. Really worried about not being able to cope in a professional environment. As in how to behave around customers, act, good time management, you know, you know, getting stuff in on time and just behaving professionally. Um, I think you need to try and convey that in an interview that you're very comfortable in a professional environment. And I also think that while you're doing your PhD, doing a bit of an internship or working with industry more is useful. And then the, I think the biggest thing they're worried about is that you will be unable to abandon an unprofitable or a cancel project. So in industry, unfortunately, a lot of projects just get abandoned because there's no money left, there's no in interest in the customer, um, and that you will need to leave that aside, just full stop, it, it's dead to you. Um, and that is something that people in the industry, especially people who haven't done a PhD themselves, worry whether you'll be able to do. I would say it's definitely an issue for some PhDs. Um, you know, they just really love science, they just read up the project, they can see that it's going somewhere, but um, I think you need to remind yourself that if no one's willing to pay for it, they're probably not going to read the report after, they're not going to do anything about it, and you just need to kind of let it go. So go into an interview with some examples of things where you had to abandon a project that just was going nowhere. I think that's good as well. 
And then sometimes employers just don't understand how a PhD relates to the job. I did have interviews where people were like, but you're not going to work on graphite or graphite is, is a long term problem for us. We have more immediate problems. And I was like, yeah, I know. I have no problem with that. So you need to explain how the skills you've learned in your PhD actually relate to the job that they have at the time. Um, definitely saw a lot of people uh, who I did my PhDs with who, let's say, did modeling related to wind turbines and they were going working for applying for jobs with modeling related to waves um and uh they really had to make the link for people people you know were like i don't i don't see how they're related and they're like oh it's very similar skills different you know very similar skills i i know the code or the code is closely related you know um you really need to make the link for them ironically in finance they seem to be like, if you have a PhD in engineering or any kind of numerate subject, I want you to come work for us. Um, so it's it's bizarre that in finance they uh, they really realize the benefit of a PhD in a, nu a numerate PhD, um, and they don't really care what it's in. So um, and that was really frustrating for a lot of people I did my PhD with. How to get hired as a startup? So um, I, I'm talking specifically about a startup because I've been less involved in the hiring process at except being involved in my, you know, going through it myself um, at a large company. Um, there's going to be a lot of cold calling. Um, and I think, um, and by that is, you're going to try and email people or contact them on LinkedIn. Um, the number one thing I want to say about this is, I think, and I definitely was the same when I was applying for jobs previously, is like, oh, it's really uncomfortable to ask for a job. I should kind of suggest that I connect or something like that. And that's just not true. Um, people are really busy. They don't have time to be connecting with, you know, every student that contacts them about connecting or just or just I'd like a chat or anything like that. Your way, that's actually a bigger ask than saying, I want a job. Here's my resume. Can you please consider me for a job? So if you're sending an email, if you're cold calling um, in startups, it's usually the first name of the person at the company name. If you're if you're looking for a hint. Um, uh, if, it, if it's a common name, it's probably first name, dot, second name. Um, try a different, few different combinations. It'll get bounced, but it's fine. Put in a clear subject. Say, Georgia Tech student in aerospace engineering wants a job or, you know, is interested in working here. And then in your, in your email, say, when you're, like, what your degree is in, where it, where it is, what you're specializing in or what your particular interests are, and you want to work here, or you want an internship, and here are the dates, and attach your resume. And the reason that you should be that clear is, is that most people who you send it to will be like, oh, I'm not particularly the person who's doing that, but I'm just going to forward this straight on to a colleague. So you want to make it something that they can do in like 10 seconds, um, rather than, oh, can I connect with you, or can we have a chat? Like, I, I'm not going to respond to that, really, but I, I, would de I will always forward on um, a good email with the resume um, to the person that I know that's hiring. Um, your network, uh, a lot of people in our company are still in contact with their professors uh, who they did their PhD with or they, they did their master's with. Um, um, so talk to your professors and ask and ask them. We get, we get sent a lot of resumes through professors. Let's say you're out living in Silicon Valley or in a startup kind of area. Um, honestly, through friends and old colleagues is a really good way. Um, harder, obviously, I know straight out of out of college, but that is actually how a lot of people I know uh, get jobs. There's a train, San Francisco to Mountain View train, and people make friends on there. And everyone on the train is an engineer and working in interesting companies. They're all working at Google, or Apple, or 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 then then all the startups and people chat to each other and they kind of chat to each other and then they hear about jobs, uh, and that's pretty common. Um, Number one thing, again, if you want a job, ask for a job. Um, I used to always be really hesitant about it, um, but but don't worry about that. Uh, resume, I, I think that you should uh, put your citizenship for a space company, put your citizenship and your visa status, in, you know, maybe not your visa status on the resume, but know your visa status. Um, particularly if you're obviously an international student, you know, so for example, for me, if I, you know, my background is in Ireland and the UK, I think you would be kind of trying to work out what my situation was. So, you know, I say I'm an Irish citizen. Um, and I think it's really important for you to know 
what your visa allows you to do, what your citizenship allows you to do. So obviously there's like, you know, 25 countries that are EAR, so export control, and they basically they can work in most stuff related to uh most of stuff related to non ITAR things pretty easily. So, so know what your your situation is, because particularly in a small company, they probably won't have someone who's responsible for all of that. They'll be trying to work it out themselves. And sometimes we've definitely seen good CVs for people or resumes where people are kind of like, oh, are they, what country are they from exactly? And it really obviously does depend. So let's try and get that, um, that out there. Some stuff about interviews that, um, you will have heard these before, but actually I'm really surprised by the number of people uh, that come into interviews that still don't do this. Learn about what the company does and also read up on the area. You don't need to have a super in-depth knowledge, but you definitely need to have looked at the website and you definitely need to like, if you're coming into Oz, you should have looked at a Wikipedia page on Hall Thrusters. The reason that is, is that um, you it'll give you an idea of what questions are gonna be asked. You don't wanna be wasting precious interview time with someone talking you through the system um and and just some it actually bothers me less but it really bothers some people that if they don't know what the uh, company's doing turn up 15 minutes early this is really really obvious but again people have issues with this turn up 15 minutes early if you're late for an interview which is like the most important thing you'll do um people are just like you're always going to be late for meetings and you're always going to be late work and that just doesn't look good have a good introduction and your resume description learned off. Really know how to talk someone through your resume and like how, how would you how you would introduce yourself. I've definitely humiliated myself in interviews by giving terrible introductions and it just starts the interview off badly. Honestly, I always thought that people actually did read my interview and you know like oh it's only kind of you know apocryphal that people only take ten seconds to read your interview. People actually really just don't have time and resumes are really boring to read so most people just have skimmed your resume so really be able to talk someone through your resume don't assume just because they've got your resume in your hand they actually know anything that's in there prepare for someone to reject your first example what i mean by this is if someone asks you a question you give an example i have a colleague that says like look i know that's your learned off answer you know i want another example so have two examples prepared and then balancing I versus we, you need to make it really clear in the interview what you did rather than, you know, oh, I was just part of a team, especially if you've done something really cool. Um, you need, you know, you need to make sure that people know what you did. Having said that, you don't want to be I, I, I all the time because work is teamwork um, and it looks a little arrogant. So you need to make it clear what you've done, um, but make sure that you're not talking about in an I fashion too much. This is some of the stuff that I see a lot of graduates and PhDs in particular make. I don't think I see older people um, kind of get it. I think it's just caused by the by coming straight out of college. I see so many uh, graduates, as in people who've just left college, who've just finished their PhD, and I, I think I was one myself who are super patronizing and arrogant in interviews, who really um act as though they like know everything they're really smart and it's like yeah I, we all know you you've you've gone to a really good university and you've done really well but absolutely everyone here at the company has got all that but as and then is more experienced than you on top of that so you need to remember that often when people i think this is something that i that i see a lot often you know graduates if someone's being nice to them or they're being self-deprecating i think that they're just trying to put you at your ease. That doesn't mean that they actually think that you know more than them. So just be careful there. Another really important thing is assuming that younger or more junior staff are less important. You know, they make a big effort for the CEO, they make a big effort for the CEO, but then by the time, you know, the more junior staff come in, they're just like, oh, whatever, you're not making a decision on hiring me. That's absolutely not true. Nearly always the young, in our company anyway, the younger, more junior staff are much better placed to quiz you on your technical performance will nearly always ask the, the junior staff what what they thought of you from a technical point of view because they're much closer to work and also they're going to be working with you a lot more um that's why they're being asked to heart to interview you even though you're more junior so uh they're going to be asked of like do you think they fit in the company can you work with them and all that kind of stuff not preparing enough for soft skill questions i think i've i've given people some interview advice for particularly going into nuclear but it's definitely a case of aerospace they're going to people are going to assume that if you've done a good degree 
um, that's your academic level. You know, you, you've got a good GPA, you, you've done a good degree. Um, so they don't need to spend too much time talking you, uh, to you about technical stuff. They're going to talk to you about soft skill, skill questions. Um, so you need to be prepared for those. But also then under preparing for easy technical questions. So again, most people won't, like most people have forgotten what they've learned in college. So they won't ask you to, something too detailed. But, you know, we ask a lot of mechanical engineers, how do you design a latch? Um, um, so you need to be prepared for those kind of easy things. Be prepared for explaining a difficult topic. Um, particularly for PhDs, be prepared for explaining a difficult topic related to your PhD to a five-year-old. Uh, I have struggled with that in the past, um, but be prepared for that. Be careful that you're not actually, you don't have terrible examples. Some people seem to have practically learned off examples that are really terrible that are not conveying what they want them to. So run through some of your examples with a friend. And then also dismissing a question as in, you know, if I ask you, I always ask people, if you start here on your very first day, what would you do? You know, talk me through a really detailed first day of what you would do. Um, um, and, you know, I'm looking for things like communication, getting a sense of where the project is right now, um, all this kind of stuff. I've seen a lot of people just dismiss the question, just go like, oh, you know, stuff. Um, and they're just really not engaging with the question. Whereas the best engineers who are really qualified, really engaged with the question. Um, and one, that shows that they know what they're doing. And two, it's more respectful to the interviewer. If an interviewer is asking you a question, they think it's important. They think it's relevant for your job. So if you're dismissing a question, you're looking like you don't know what you're talking about. You're looking like you look like you don't have the experience. And then also you're disrespectful to the interviewer. Um, and that's just not a great attitude. So be careful on that. Oh, one point on the being patronizing and arrogant. The important thing, reason not to be patronizing and arrogant is because people are worried that you're going to be like that in work and that they won't want to work with you. So that's the that's why I emphasize that. Uh, OK, ask for every opportunity you're interested in. This is kind of, I think, the key to my success is that I always ask for an opportunity. If I see something, I'm like, oh, can I do that? Or that's a project. I want to do that. I think it's really crucial. I think a lot of people assume that you're just going to be offered opportunities and that people will think of you. And often that's just not the case. People are really busy. So they just don't think of you. But if you ask, they'll be like, yeah, you're maybe you're the best qualified or maybe you're qualified enough. And you asked for it and you want it. So great. Taking taking the job off me. Managers often don't like if, if there's a job that's been hanging around for a while, that probably means the manager doesn't like that job themselves. And they're just like they're hesitating to offer it. So they think it's a horrible job. But Everyone likes different things. And if you're like, I would like that job, um, you know, ask for it because they, they've, they've just been hesitating to give it to someone. Obviously, also, no one knows what you like except for you. So if you're, if you're not interested, if people assume you're not interested if you're not asking for it, you're going to get rejected lots about it. Um, that's the thing. If you ask for lots of opportunities, you're going to be rejected loads. So you need to develop a thick skin about that. But you also need to listen to why you're being rejected. Like, you know, do you not have the qualifications? Do people think that your personality isn't there for that? You know, are you not experienced enough? So you can listen to that and then, you know, it's an opportunity you wanted, you've gotten rejection and you've gotten feedback on why you couldn't do it. So I think that's, um, that's really useful. That's probably the most useful aspect of this. And then if you don't ask, someone else is gonna ask and you're just going to be furious that you didn't ask. So, um, so here's a, I don't actually mean if someone offers, this is me driving a forklift in work. Someone asks you to drive a forklift, drive a forklift. But take every opportunity you're offered. Um, you know, I took my scholarship, I, you know, um, and, I, and I ran with that. Don't worry too much about the opportunity or how you got it. I spoke about that previously. Just use it as a chance to show off what you can do. During college or your PhD or early in career, don't close off opportunities. You know, if you get offered, if you get a chance to do an internship you know, in finance, do an internship in finance, you know, take it, take a, an opportunity to go and work in Italy, uh, you know, at a, an experimental facility there, you know, do a, con do a conference, do a course. Um, you just take all those opportunities because really, honestly, you're still working out what you want to do with your life. And even if you think you've got a really sort of plan that can change totally. So just don't close off opportunities and try not to overthink opportunities based on your current plan. You know, when you're 10 years out of work, uh, 10 years out of college, then you can be like, I have a restructured plan, but just take all the opportunities to see what you like. And you have honestly no idea where the opportunity will take you. Like I definitely would not have done a PhD in nuclear engineering, and I definitely would not be working in Silicon Valley, and I would not be a CEO if I hadn't done that initial uh, research project um, 
research internship in nuclear. So you just really need to just say yes to a lot of stuff. And then obviously when you get an opportunity, particularly one that you've asked for, you really need to work really hard. Like the reason that I did so well in that nuclear internship is that I was really killing myself. I was like, I don't know anyone in, in San Diego. I have no friends here. I'm going to be working really late and, and like, I'm just going to be the best intern they've ever had. Um, and so you need, really need to work hard at opportunities. Big thing for graduates, time management is more important than you think. Um, I think a lot of people come out of college and they're just like, oh, I can just do the work and I, if it's done, it's done. It's not the case in the professional world. It's all teamwork. So your disorganization can destroy your team's work. I see a lot of people who are a lot older than you who make these mistakes. So if you're running a project and anything is a project, if you're writing a report, if you're doing a test, you need to work out to who's involved. And things like I think that people miss are a report needs to be reviewed before it goes out to a customer. Um, you know, a test plan needs to be reviewed. Um, some, someone might need to do a, do a graph or approve a graph. And like, it might be a tiny bit of work, but it still needs to be done. And it still needs to be done in a schedule. So you need to plan all of those. Some people are really bad about giving advance notice. They think that they, because they don't want advance notice, they'll just can turn up and say, can you do something tomorrow? That's just not the case. Um, never, you need to give people advance notice. Never, ever, ever say, I pulled an all-nighter to get this done. Um, I think that people think that it makes them look like, oh, I, I work really hard. I got it through in the end. Honestly, that would just panic me as manager because it would just, like, what if you hadn't got it done? Um, so they, I, I would not give you a crucial project if, if you were saying things like that. So just never say that. Even if you did it, just never say it. Deliver easy projects early so some people again think that like oh the deadline is the deadline but like honestly if, if it's an easy project you should be able to get it done early it's all demonstration that you can actually do a harder project and also think about what tasks you can knock out early in the day or the week or the month that help other people get on with their work you know work, work, learn what tasks how your tasks relate to other people and do it based on that prioritization you need to agree prioritization with your team or your manager or your project program manager. Um, don't go and prioritize tasks and then in your head and don't tell anyone what the prioritization is because you could get it wrong and the your PM could disapprove of the way you've prioritized. It's a fact you're going to have a load of programs um, at once. You're going to have a load of deadlines at once. You're going to have a load of projects. They're not all going to be done to the same standard. That's just, you know, the world of work. So you need to work out what ones need to be done to the highest standard, what ones can be done to a lower standard. And you need, but you need to get agreement for that in, for that in advance. Um, and also it's way easier to get an extension earlier in a project rather than later. It's really unprofessional than later. This is a controversial opinion. When the office is reopen, go to the office. You are at a stage in your career where you need to be learning as much as possible from more experienced staff. And the best way to do that is go to the office. It's the best way to build a strong ne network. And you're also in the office when opportunities arrive. Right? So if a new program comes in, you're there, you can ask for the program. So that's really important. Good written and oral communication is key differentiator. Um, I would definitely take, uh, I did debated in uh, college and that made me less defensive in um, meetings, which is hugely important. Um, focus, uh, focus on things like meetings are really important. It's actually more important than something like a presentation. You're, you're going to be in a lot more meetings. Meetings are where um, you need to convey your ideas more, you can prepare for, for them less. So focus on meetings, focus on emails, comments on documents rather than necessarily reports. Learn learn about communication there. And take on the really hard jobs. Managers really appreciate people to take on the really hard jobs they've been struggling to do themselves. Um, so if you like it, if you like it, if you feel you can do something, take on the really hard job. Okay, I was asked to give some thoughts on being a woman in STEM, and I'm also really conscious that I've only got five minutes. So, um, number one thing, if you're actually receiving bad treatment from an individual, tell your manager or HR. Um, I don't know if you know this, but the law is such that if you tell your company, they become legally liable. If you tell your manager, you know, the company is legally liable, but actually you've removed a lot of the legal liability if you don't tell them and you don't really have a leg to stand on later. So you need to tell people, your manager or your HR. Um, the good news, I was asked to think about some hardships um, being a woman in STEM. Uh, I think some of these apply um, being kind of international as well. 
look, they definitely exist and they're unpleasant, but, you know, they have had no long term negative effect on my career. I definitely do not think that I have been held back in my career for being a woman. Um, they've definitely reduced over time. Um, they was a bigger issue in academia versus industry. I think that's because there's more HR in industry. People are more conscious of the law in industry. With age and experience, people are probably less likely to say things to me, and I'm also better at managing bad behavior, as in shutting down bad behavior. Obviously, as I've become more senior, people are less likely to be sexist towards me, and I do think that Me Too has helped. So I do think it's improving, and also I do think that in the long term, um, it has not been too negative for me. Advice that I've given to someone recently about if it's bothering you. So if you're thinking about being a woman engineer or an international engineer or a gay engineer or anything, if you're spending a lot of time thinking about that, that's not normal. Like I don't spend a lot of I've had worked in places where I spend a lot of time thinking about it. And I have worked in places like now where I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. And I think that it's not, you sh the first thing you should know is that it's not normal. And it's probably a sign of a company wide problem. And I think a lot of people that I've spoken to is they're like, I know it's a company wide problem. I know I can't change it. But the fact is, I'm getting this really unique or valuable experience. Um, and I think this is the case, you know, for everyone, like, you know, maybe you're being bullied in work. I think it's really easy to convince ourselves that experience is unique or valuable, especially when we're feeling bad about ourselves because we're being bullied or because we're being treated badly. So I think you need to write down the experience that you think is unique or you think is valuable and you need to prove to yourself that it's unique. You need to find, you know, you need to make sure that you can't get it elsewhere. You know, there are like, for example, there are dozens of rocket companies right now. I think we used we think a lot of things are unique, but they're not really. That's the first thing. And you also, if something's valuable, you need to find job ads that show that you need that skill or that experience. Prove to yourself that's valuable, because I think that sometimes we can just be like unwilling to change the situation. So and like the thing is, is that my advice to, to people is you're a fab engineer. You're really good. And companies are absolutely hungry for great staff and great talent. You can move to a different job where they treat you well and just ignore that company that's got a terrible attitude, you know, you know, they'll suffer in the long term because good staff will leave because they've got a bad culture. So that would be my major advice. If you're feeling you're not getting opportunities. So I think this is definitely a case for international students as well, where, you know, you just don't have as much in common with the boss, for example, I think is is this is one that I've seen a lot. I, you know, you didn't go to the same college. You know, you're not into the same sports, you know, whatever. They're not from the same area as you. They just might not think of you for opportunities. And I think that's really serious. And I also think it's really hard to do with. I think you need to help ask for help from more senior managers. You need to tell them what the issue is, men, women, whoever, and ask them for help. And I've definitely seen that help um, with people I've seen not getting opportunities. But you then also just need to make sure that people can see what you're doing as much as possible. You need to see the people, people to see that you're a great engineer rather than just not thinking of you. So get put on projects with decision makers. I've moved office to be in the same office as someone who is a decision maker. And I want them to see that I was a great engineer and I was thinking through things in a good engineering fashion. And I think that's really important, like write reports that they have to read over prepare for presentations that they will be asked. I think you need to make it so it's not just a, an unconscious bias where they're forgetting about you. You need to make it so that like they can see you're a great engineer and if they're still not giving you the opportunities, then you've got more ground to stand on. I think this all comes down to as well, asking for opportunities. Um, really important um, for mentoring, um, choosing a mentor that you're comfortable with. Um, if you're a woman engineering, you'll almost certainly have to have a male mentor. Loads of my mentors have been men. It's been totally fine. Never do anything you're uncomfortable with. Just say like you've got plans. Um, but I think that's a major one. Networking. Um, the most important place to network is actually in work. Um, I think people, and I think I often used to think like, oh, networking at conferences, networking at these kind of one-off events, people don't get to see your work as much. I actually think that people who can really vouch for your work in the long term are your former colleagues and your former bosses. Um, we get a huge number of staff through network references, just the CV being sent. So just really be conscious of the fact that your colleagues are your best reference long term and then do ask for help from them. As a woman, I would say it's really important to maintain a network of professional women. They can give you advice. You know, 
in your they can give you industry specific advice and just um, can be a good sounding board. Again, don't worry about where opportunities come from. I would certainly, if I was an international student, I would join you know an international society. I would really take advantage of that network. People can be trying to find staff. You know, old alumni can come back through that. So I think that's all useful. Um, and then basically, I think internships are really good for experience and references. Um, the PhD is extremely useful in industry, but it's not essential. Um, do a PhD for the right reasons. Um, always ask, always, always, always ask for a job or an opportunity, but put your absolute best effort in for that then. And then time management, prioritization, and communication are, I think, the essential basics that um, a lot of graduates are missing that, that make the difference. Sorry, I've totally run over time there, Kira. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. I actually like prepared some of the questions before the presentation, but you answered all of them. And okay. I want to thank you again for your time. And um, it's like kind of emotional as well for me having you here because I am very passionate about propulsion and I've been like turned away so many times just because I'm international. So like you being here, it means so, so much to me. And like, I just can't express how, how grateful I am for you being here and your beautiful presentation. Thank you so much for having me here. It's been really nice. And um, I had a look at some of the earlier presentations as well, and I actually learned a lot from them as well. So hopefully I managed to give you some useful tips. Thank you. Um, Dr. Haverty, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Ricky, and I am a year older than Kira and had flagged Apollo Fusion as a company that we absolutely wanted to have on. And I'm so grateful to her that she reached out and that you responded my heart is genuinely beating so fast right now again it's like a very emotional thing to have um been told as students for for me like five years that something that you really want and might be qualified for is not possible at all um and it's often like presented from like people you might trust like your professors but it's uh absolutely wrong <laughs> and that's what we're trying to debunk with these conversations and I also um, again for you wanted to just share something that an Irish student who was on this presentation shared as you were speaking with me um, they said I love her I'm fangirling thank you so much for having her on I feel so seen I've been told in Ireland what job would I do with aerospace and so again for just any Irish student listening to this now or in the future, everything that you shared is so meaningful. Um, Kira and I will be thanking you again with an email to follow up as well, but we just wanted to thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me and thank you so much for your lovely comments. Um, yeah, I think just one thing about the propulsion and many things to do with space, they're not ITAR. And if they're not ITAR, it really, really reduces the um, the issues related to, to it. So. The number one thing I suppose for that is learn what you're allowed to do. Do that research yourself. Find out what kind of list, the country lists your, your country's on. See what that, that actually means. It's all available on the internet. That's how we as companies do the research. Companies are just worried about going to jail. So you just need to make sure that you do the research for them and just, ex just you know, explain it. And you just, unfortunately, you need to get used to people kind of coyly asking about your citizenship and your visa and situations. and. People still do it with me and it's awkward, but you know, you just need to be prepared. Um, yeah, thank you. Hi, Dr. Howardy. Sorry, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Saj, I'm from Sri Lanka and I'm from the University of Alabama. I also want to thank Kira and Ricky, Ricky for organizing this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I think that's the end of the event and uh, if uh, we kind of run over like the time and stuff so if anybody else has like any questions like let me or Ricky know um, and hopefully we can provide the answer. So I hope everyone enjoys their Saturday and thank, thank you again for everyone for participating. Thank you Kira. Bye.